Hello, I'm Steve Berman, and this is Tyler, who is our host at Tyler Cod. Tyler has a particularly warm belly from resting and reading some of the people that we're going to speak to tonight. So tonight's panel is on writing the first novel. I've only written one novel, um, but it's been a few years and I don't know if my advice about writing first novels is very apt anymore. And Tyler doesn't think so either. So I'm gonna let him go and get our other guests. And I hope to see you momentarily. Thank you. Hello everyone, and I'm back here at TylerCon, and we have four wonderful writers to talk to uh, and learn from in tonight's panel, which is on writing the first novel. So I will ask each of our panelists to um, introduce themselves briefly and <laughs> mention your book, of course, that your first novel, and we're going to go first with Laura. Hi, uh, my name is Laura Bogart, and my uh, first novel, which is called Don't You Know I Love You, has this wonderful cover, and um, it is out from Dezank Books. Um, and um, before I published uh, my novel, I was a freelancer. Um, I, I mean, I still do. Um, I am a regular contributor to The Week, and I've been published in The Atlantic, The Guardian, um, Salon, uh, Dame Magazine, um, and uh, The AV Club, um, and um, gosh, among other publications. So um, that is where you can find me. Well, hello. My name is Jonathan Harper. I, I am the uh, author of the short story collection Daydreamers uh, that I was very fortunate to have Steve Berman publish uh, in 2015. Uh, I uh, am an alumnus of the MFA creative writing program at American University, uh, where I work as a staff member, and I have just finished my first novel, The Impossible. All right, Amy. Um, I'm Amy Payne. Um, I am an alumnus of the Vermont College of Fine Arts MFA program and Clarion, back when it was still in Michigan. Um, my first novel is, um, it was called Blackbird. It has, it is in the, uh, in the trunk. <laughs> oh no! Um, well, but we will, we will revive. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Allison. I am Allison. I write under the name AC Wise. Um, my first novel was actually just formally announced about a week and a half ago and will be published in June 2021 by Titan Books and it is called Wendy Darling. Um, I do have two collections that Steve kindly published um, and I also have a novella out in the world uh, called Catfish Lullaby which was published by Broken Eye Books. So that's me. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, so of course, being at TylerCon and it's at night, I am drinking. Tonight's panel is brought to you by Kahlua, um, which is apparently $22.99 in Greenfield, Massachusetts. <laughs> <clears throat> and it says Kahlua and cream. Um, so there may be some like milk and heavy cream in there. I have no idea if that's going to be any good, but we'll find out. Sounds good. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> much better than the, the last time when I, I was on a panel or no, it was an in, uh, interview and I meant to do a gin and tonic and I just forgot the tonic. Oh, <laughs> it's like a glass full of gin. Great gin. That sounds like a great oh. Tuesday night to me. Yeah. So, and of course. <laughs> like, what's the problem? <laughs> yes. All, all the members of our audience do remember that because they, they've been watching each of these religiously. <laughs> great. So, uh, Tyler has a list of our questions that he spent all day creating. <laughs> um, let's go with the first one, which is, you're all to be lauded for finishing your novel, uh, and some of you have even sold it. So, let's talk about how you wrote. What kind of schedule? Did you write every day? Did you work off a detailed outline? Did you 
reward meeting your word count with expensive chocolates or you know caviar these are the things that tyler and our audience would like to know so jonathan said you were laughing at that i think that uh let's go you talk about how you wrote oh dear i mean Oh, this is such a hard question to answer because I sort of went through a little evolution over the last few years. Uh, when I was doing the short story collection, I, I just had a different lifestyle. So I had a very consistent writing schedule, usually four days a week where I could dedicate on average three to four hours. Uh, but that was then. And in that time between that book and I actually starting to work on the novel, uh, I just had a lot of life events happened. My, my job sort of, you know, changed. And, um, you know, my, my husband suddenly had a job on the other side of the country. So I was managing a house on my own for a year and a half. I had an elderly cat that needed care. Like, like adult life started happening. And it was amazing how a month could go by. And I realized I hadn't done any work. And I, I kind of reached the stage where I, I realized I had to adapt or else I had to give this up. So, I've never believed you have to write every single day, but you have to write and work consistently. And I started to re sort of evaluate what working on the book was. And it turned into having that like hour before I went to bed every night to actually just take the time to think, to maybe do a little bit of internet research, to take notes and to help kind of craft that working kind of flexible outline, not too detailed, and that could evolve as well. And that way, when I did have those, those chunks of time where I could dedicate, like I had a working document that could kind of keep me on track and keep me goal-oriented. Uh, and you also, though, let me mention, you also believe in those writing retreats you would go to, is like some cabin in some desolate area that you had to like, you know, go to the well for water and <laughs> you know, shout down if there was a Timmy inside. It, it was exactly like that. Um, I've gone to, to Virginia Center for the Creative Arts, but I, I really love the Writer's Colony of at, at Gary Hollow in Eureka Springs, Arkansas. I do a two-week residency at least once a year. Uh, I'm supposed to be at that residency shortly, so that's not happening this year. Um, but, but that was always very good for me because it, it does require you to be gone for two weeks, be in a confined colony setting where you, you don't have TV going on, you, you aren't maintaining any sort of adult life, work is turned off. And so for two weeks, that would be kind of where I would get a good chunk of hard, not, not good quality, but good hard technical writing done. But it was also two weeks to strategize. And every time I've left there, even if I didn't have, you know, mountains of pages, I, I still had notebooks filled and I still had a very clear sense of purpose and a strategy moving forward. And, and that's really been the saving grace. It, it, it's a commitment, both in time and money, but it has helped keep me productive and actually seeing things at completion. Great. Amy, would you like to give some insight into your process? Yeah, so um, it, it was interesting. The Blackbird, I started it while I was in my MFA program. I hadn't written a novel before that. And I'm not sure I recommend that, <laughs> but, but, um, I finished, I started it like partway through, it ended up being like my, um, creative thesis. And then I did finish it after, which was the, which was, cause when you're in the MFA program, you have, you get into the, um, really good, you know, writing every day or writing consistently. It really, you have to, or you can't keep up. Um, so that helped a lot and I just kept that momentum going afterward and I've, I'm not the fastest writer in the world. Um, I get distracted really easily. Um, Facebook is like the bane of my existence if I want to get any writing done. Um, but I've, I came up with this whole little, like, algorithm in my head. <laughs> like, I have to write this many words. But if I'm on a roll, I can write more. That doesn't mean I can take away from tomorrow's writing. I still have to write that. And it's it's not very many words, but I have always find that if I sit down and say, well, you have to write like 100 words, then by the time you get to 100 words, you're, you're going to write more. So it, it's kind of like I would lure myself in with the promise of freedom, <laughs> and then I didn't want it when I got there. Um, 
<laughs> I, I did not outline Blackbird ahead of time. I was flying by the seat of my pants and I don't think that works for me. <laughs> it was, it was crazy. Um, but I'm not like, a, I have a friend who she has a outline that she writes that is so detailed and I don't do that either. Um, but it's good to know like loosely. Um, so I, I discovered that in the course of writing Blackbird. Allison. Yes. Um, so I took a very, very backwards approach to writing a novel. It started out as a flash fiction story, uh, which was published at Daily Science Fiction. This is obviously the most logical way to start a novel is with, <laughs> you know, 1500 words. Um, and then I started, you know, thinking about it and thinking, okay, well, maybe this is something I want to explore further, maybe write a longer story or expand it into a novella. So I did try to expand it into a novella, kind of sent it around to a couple people for feedback. They're like, this is great, but it's actually a novel. So I then went about trying to expand the novella into a novel. Um, none of this with any real plot per se, uh, pants the whole thing. Um, with an idea of where I was going though. So there was sort of a vague outline in my head, but nothing really formal that I did. Um, and so it was just sort of a matter of continually expanding what existed until it somehow ended up being novel shaped, which is not a process I would necessarily recommend to anybody, but I did manage to make it work somehow. Um, and I'm, I do have a full-time day job as well. So the way I did my most of my writing was just try to set aside my lunch hour every day and write as much as I could in you know 35 or 40 minutes that I could get away from my desk there's a little cafe just down the street from where I work I would go there most days do as much writing or editing as I could and then head back to work and manage to make that work for me so did you include in your dedication uh, the cafe I haven't written the dedication yet, but I will have to include them. <laughs> All right. And, and just remember how to spell my name, too. Of course, of course. <laughs> uh, I, I, I'm curious. It's, this is an interesting point. Um, when someone tells you you've written the short story and they say, no, this is a novel, I mean, how did you, did you at, at, at some point go, no, this cannot be a novel. This is clearly a short story. Or did you instantly discern, oh my goodness, here lies the seeds of greatness. <laughs> I, I did fight it for a while when people kept saying the novella should be expanded into a novel. I'm like, but I don't write novels. I'm a short fiction writer. I can't possibly do this. I don't know what I'm doing. Um, and then the more I thought about it, I was like, well, why not just try? And if it doesn't work, oh well, like, you know, I still have the draft that was the novella, so I can always go back to that. Um, and I did, you know, at least start the process of changing it from a flash fiction piece into a novella unprompted. So nobody was forcing me to do that. <laughs> that, that may be more remarkable in terms of the percentage of size increase. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, it's one of those stories that just, I guess, I kept thinking about and kept thinking about. And um, actually, the way the Glitter Squadron collection that you published was born, too. I kept thinking about it and kept thinking about it, wouldn't leave me alone, so I just started writing more. <laughs> awesome. Laura, please, let's hear from you. Um, so I actually went to the MFA program with Jonathan, that's how we know each other, and um, I, when I was in the MFA program, interestingly enough, that is where I became like a nonfiction writer and an essayist. And so, but I was still taking fiction classes. And then toward the end of what I was working on, um, you know, in, in my, my coursework, I started doing a little, some short stories and I was like, I'm going to link these short stories. That's what I'm going to do. Um, and I remember having conversations with people, sort of like what you were saying, Allison, where they were like, honey, no, like, this is a novel, <laughs> like, you just have to do it. Um, and I was very scared to write a novel. I did not know how to do it. And I just thought, I know short form pieces. I know how to complete thoughts within a span of 1500 words. That's what I know how to do. But I did want to pursue it. The character sort of lingered in my head and would not stop talking to me um, and making themselves known. And so 
uh, in my first attempt, I thought, I'm going to outline the shit out of this. I'm going to, like, lock down everything. I'm going to, like, stage direct it. And that did not work because I basically, like, choked the life out of my own process. And the characters were like, N no, <laughs> like, we want to, like, live and breathe and and play and be unpredictable. Um, so I had to junk my big outline and just go, I know what the end point is. I know what the end image is. How do I get there? How do I work back from that? And then I just had to sort of like trust my own intuition and go with it. And so it started off incredibly regimented, but sort of loosely pants, I guess you might say, like very loose fitting seat of the pants. Um, and so I was balancing this, you know, for a time I was balancing it with like writing essays and like publishing essays. And I sort of just like wasn't making a ton of progress on it. And then finally I was like, just finish it. Like the worst that can happen is nothing. In which case I just spent time with these characters. I wrote and enjoyed myself and that's it. And I, you know, so I, I, I barreled through it, basically forced myself to finish it. I would say like 2015, like got very serious about it. So that is, that's how it came into the world. And I'm, I'm a, I'm a complete night owl. I am not a day walker by any stretch of the imagination. So this is an after hours endeavor. So <clears throat> when you said loose, loose fitting pants, I always think of like old people yelling at young people to pull up their pants. Yeah, that's what it was like. Awesome. So, um, you've all finished. Great. The question, so how long did you take? How long did it take, say? And then really, the, the, what Tyler really wants to know is, mm -hmm. um, how do you know when you're done? Because isn't there that temptation to constantly tinker? I know Jonathan has had this very experience, but I'm sure you all have, like, you know, there's always that sense that you could make it better, or at least the, the fear that it's, it's too soon and at some point you have to let go. And how do you know that that is the right, it's the right time? So Allison, would you like to, since you just recently sold your book? Sure. Um, I can't remember exactly how long it took me to draft it. I'm fairly fast in terms of writing first drafts and then the editing is usually what takes me the longest. And I definitely have that temptation to keep picking at it and picking at it and picking at it. Um, usually for me, it just comes to a point where it's not that I necessarily know that it's finished, but I'm absolutely sick of looking at it. <laughs> and I just need to push it out of my hands and into somebody else's hands so I won't continually pick at it, whether that's passing it off to somebody for a beta read or throwing it out to my critique group or passing it along to the agent and being like, is this viable? Please somebody else tell me if it's at all close to being done because I cannot tell anymore. <laughs> um, hopefully one day I'll develop a better sense for when something is actually done myself, but a lot of it is just like, I cannot look at this anymore and I need some, some other set of eyes on it to tell me, you know, what to do next. <laughs> Amy? So yeah, I'm not sure it's done yet. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, I will say though, I, I kind of agree with, you know, you get to a point where, and in my head it's, uh, I can't make this any better where I am right now as a writer. I can't do any better than this and maybe someday in the future I can um, but this is what I can do with it now um, and so that's kind of um, not, I'm not sure that Blackbird taught me that but my second book did <laughs> um, but that's kind of how um, like it, and it is kind of the same thing I just can't look at it anymore <laughs> Laura um yeah, I mean, I, so it, it took me, like I said, I sort of did it in fits and starts, so probably about, like, four years or so, and then, like, the last year was, like, really barreling into it, and then I took time away from it, like, when I just finished the draft, like, raw finished it, um, and I, but I also tend to edit as I go, that is, I, I am, like, incapable of doing the, like, 
you know, quick first draft. And I so admire people who can, because I am constantly picking off the nits and um, working and revising. And, and by the time I'm done, um, so I've already done a lot of, of revision as I go. Um, but it, 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 for me, it was that feeling of like, I'm fatigued. I do like, I don't know what I can add to it. Um, and then giving it to friends, giving it to beta readers who could add things. I like revision. I like be, I was like in a place where I was like, just tell me what to do and what to add to it. Um, and then, um, based on that feedback, when I had integrated everything from the kind of initial beta readers, then I was like, okay, then, then I think I'm done. Like, I think this is as close to cooked as it can be. And then, but I didn't want to like overdo it because you can work on something too much. All right, Jonathan. <laughs> um, I, well, I mean, are you ever really done? <laughs> I would hope at this point, yes, so that one day it will be published and I can read it. <laughs> I mean, because because I mean, when I had my my first reading for the short story collection, and I kid you not, um, I was in the back of the bookstore with a pencil, still making line edits in the actual copy of the book right before I walked out to read it. <laughs> I hope you did not give them to me to to actually. Yeah. No, the book had already been published. It was like the right. <laughs> <laughs> but you didn't you didn't say Steve I'd like some you know changes here at the you know 13th hour I know <laughs> um yeah so I mean I, I I think when you were talking about is a manuscript done there's there's two very technical ways of looking at this there's there's um especially for something long like a novel uh you know is the actual, is it structurally complete? Are all the loose ends tied up? Can you at least walk through every action and decision that spans from beginning to end and be like, this made sense? So, so to me, that was a very big milestone of completion. And it took me three drafts to kind of get there, going back and filling in gaps and, and again, looking at notes and, and, and sort of reconfiguring. Um, but then there is that entire idea of style and, and the, the personal touch, the ethos of the characters um, uh, uh, that kind of rounds it out. And, and that's the part that I had a really, I still have a really hard time with um, uh, uh, because I, I know that I've reached that milestone that at least what physically happens is the best I can do on my own at this stage. Um, but even now, as I am sending out and soliciting agents, I will send out an agent inquiry. And then the next day, I'm like, okay, so what can I tinker with now under the slight chance they might get back to me in six to eight weeks? <laughs> I think this period could be a comma. <laughs> you know. Well, um, some of you have already touched upon this, and which means that you'll just have to elaborate more. But um, Tyler is a huge reader. Uh, primarily, it's cat food uh, labels, but every so often he does like a good, you know, work of, you know, experimental fiction, because that, that's that's his niche. Um, so, what about uh, work workshopping beta readers, trusted, you know, people that who do you share this with? Is there is there a method to this? Do you, you know? Is there a pact, a secret pact? Um, I'm going to start with Amy because it just so happens I know that she she lives with another writer, he who is not to be named. Um, he doesn't so, anything. <laughs> who, who is also sort of you know I I also sort of a first novelist too, so or many first novelists. So go uh, ahead. I do have, uh, so my class um, that we all graduated together from the program, we're still very close, um, and we tend to read stuff for each other. It, I think it's really hard with a novel um, to, to workshop an entire novel unless you, unless everybody's willing to read it all, um, or you get kind of people they read a couple of chapters in the middle and they're like, well, I don't know who this is. And it's, it's like, well, I'm not, I can't reintroduce them in every single chapter. Um, and it, you know, it's totally, it's fair. It might not be there, but it's not 
necessarily helpful in the context of a novel, whereas a short story, they would know the context. And, and so it's difficult. And so you just, you need people who are going to be with you on the long haul. <laughs> and my partner, Will, is not one of those people. <laughs> he does not read my fiction before he is not a beta reader for me. Um, I'll so, edit out his name and we'll bleep it out or something like that. Oh, oh sorry. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Willie Nelson is your, is your <laughs> it's amazing it's amazing he doesn't he doesn't read anything of mine <laughs> but I do have a couple of people in the class that I'm closer with that we do kind of um encouraging readings in the beginning um so when we're drafting we might send them a couple chapters and they'll read through and, and just they kind of focus more on this this interests me this interests me they're not really pointing out like major, they might say something major like, okay, I hope this is going somewhere because it seems important, but it's all supposed to be a cheerleader kind of thing. And then when the draft is done, that's when the, that's when the knives come out. <laughs> mm. All right. Jonathan? Uh, I, I think it was very, very useful for many years. But again, I mean, I went for this big kind of life evolution thing and I actually did not work with any beta readers. I, I didn't really give my work out. I did three drafts entirely on my own. And and part of that was just because I, I felt very strongly that I should not ask somebody to read my work if I am not able to return the favor. And I just didn't think with especially my work schedule, I would be able to dedicate the time and attention to someone else. Um, so uh, I actually waited until I had gotten the draft to, to as, as strong as I could get it. Uh, I hired an editor, and then once when that was cleaned up and, and formatted, that's when I actually asked three good trusted friends to be those beta readers to kind of help me finesse and kind of know, you know, what kind of, uh, you know, what could be added, kind of what, what Laura was talking about earlier. How did you find the editor? Uh, I worked with Angela Brown, and, and she was absolutely fantastic, and, and, and she was very good for kind of that, that technical structure. She gave me some really great insight. Um, I, I just didn't want to send it to anyone and be like, oh, I've been working on this for two to three years, and, mm. and then be embarrassed by the response. So she, she was a really great intermediary. <laughs> How did you find Angela? Uh, I, I knew her from... Back in the uh, back, back when I had worked at the Lambda Literary Foundation, she had been a, an editor at Allison Publications. So I've I've kind of kept in touch with her over over uh, the Facebook for many years. <laughs> so I will break in as a point of advice to members of our audience that uh, you'd be amazed how these people that you meet briefly and the, the connections will serve you well. So try not to be an asshole. <laughs> um, <laughs> And seriously, I think that most people in this writing community um, and its various subcultures, whether it be speculative fiction, gay, literary, you know, Western, <laughs> they, they tend to want everyone to succeed. It's not a zero-sum game. So, All right, Laura. So I had... Um... When I finished, I had, um, for my, my beta readers, I had um, a few people who were other writers, and, like, I would read things of theirs um, in exchange. And then I also had a few people who were not writers, because I was very curious what sort of, like, the the just the straight up just readers some people who did not have um an understanding of craft in the same way maybe like what they would think and i gave them um a copy and then afterward i would take them out to dinner and just get their like honest opinions about it and that led to some really um interesting things that happen. I mean, I, I have two friends that read it and they were like, well, this is set in Baltimore and you grew up in Baltimore, but there's not enough Baltimore in here. And so um, I really focused on like integrating place into the story more. And I don't know that that's something that just, you know, these people also being friends of mine who grew up in the city would like you know, they noticed it, and I think it made it a stronger piece. So that was also really useful, and if it's possible, I might encourage people to do that, um, because I, I found it very helpful. So 
I, I had sort of a cross section and then like the way I thought about the feedback was if there were things that were consistent across the board, I was like, okay, that's probably something that I need to address. And then if it were things that like one person like this way and then the other person was eh, then I'd be a tiebreaker myself and I would go like, what do I feel like instinctually like works here? But I found using a couple people to be useful because there were a few things that people like universally liked and were like, don't tweak this. And there were a few things that people were universally like, uh, like, can you expand on this or maybe pare it back? So um, that was my approach. And did the, the type of restaurant matter in this whole thing? Like, in other words, like, oh no, I, 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 I have to be, you know, it's Indian food and thus, you know, or, or was it, no, did, did there have to be a linen tablecloth? No, like no. So um, there was a place in Baltimore. I don't know if it's still open, but it was a sci-fi themed diner. And um, they had like old 50s, like inspired, um, like sci-fi, like like truly, like they would be making fun of it on like Mystery Science Theater 3000 Atom kind of stuff. Atomic Age stuff. Yes. Yes, very, very much so. So that was where I took people. And then I think I also took people to another very, uh, like, very Baltimore, like, very a kitschy kind of fun places. So, yeah, I mean, I, I mean, it's what I could afford to do. Yeah. <laughs> like, uh, like, I ain't taking anybody to Roos Chris, <laughs> you know? Um, all right. So, so it's just like the time when I took a friend who had a peanut allergy to Longhorn. Not oh. a good, no. It never happened, but no. that was only after he gave a bad review of my novel. Oh, yeah, no, no. <laughs> Allison, have you ever killed anyone with a peanut? <laughs> I have not, that I know of. <laughs> that I know of. Um, so I'm very lucky to have a wonderful critique group. Um, we've been trading stories back and forth for at least five years now, if not longer. Um, with this novel, I would sort of send them chunks of chapters at a time. I think I would do like three or four chapters at a time, which might not be the ideal way necessarily to read a novel, but, um, you know, it was at least the same group of people consistently reading the whole thing, even if it was a little bit at a time, kind of a month apart between each time we met. Um, and then once I had everything together, I had one person outside of the critique group kind of look at the thing as a whole after I'd integrated all the edits from my critique group and put everything together so that I could hopefully see that it did actually all hang together structurally and made sense as something that one would read sort of straight through. May I ask how you developed the critique group? Um, so this is all, we're mostly all based kind of in the Philadelphia area where I live and we had met each other, I guess, through an in-person critique group at various times. Um, and at some point, you know, we just decided, well, hey, why don't we just start doing this regular online meetup? Because the in-person groups that we were in variously at that time weren't doing what we wanted you know, for us, and we all were kind of looking for something else right around the same time. So we all came together, you know, as as friends who knew each other, who knew each other's writing, and who had been in in-person critique groups together at one point or another um, to form something that we are still meeting regularly um, once a month online and swapping stories back and forth. Oh, that sounds wonderful. Um, and I can tell you some good restaurants in Philly. I'm sure you know them, but if, if, if we have to use the Laura technique. There you, know, you go, if I have to lure anybody. <laughs> <laughs> so, again, great that you have all finished your book. I, I cannot applaud you enough. It's so difficult to finish a novel. Um, they can be such nightmares sometimes. Um, but let's talk about looking back at the process what did you you know realize went horribly awry and that you would never try doing again i know amy touched on this a little uh but and then was there anything that was a joyous discovery like hey i didn't think i knew that i could do this or this technique really worked for me so amy do you mind starting so, like I said, um, just 
writing, <laughs> trying to just plow straight through without any kind of idea where I was going. That was kind of the main um, disastrous thing <laughs> uh, that took much longer to kind of unpick that knot than, than I would have liked. Um, but the great thing that came out of it was just, it changed, finishing the first novel, even the first draft of it, changed how I thought of myself as a writer. Because before it's like, can I even do this? Do I have, do I have other ideas? Does it, is it all writing on this idea? And, you know, I finished it and I had a ton of other ideas and it's just, it just the confidence from, yes, I actually finished this thing. I printed it out so it would be an actual thing that I could touch. Um, Cause that's <laughs> the thing with writing. You work and work and work and there's nothing to touch at the end until it's published and you're kind of finished in a way before that. <laughs> and so it feels, you know, it, it can be like, I also um, crochet and knit. When you're done with that project, you have a thing that you can, <laughs> and, and with the book, um, it takes a lot longer to get there. And so, so yeah, just the idea that I can do this and I, so I'll do it again. And it's not so much writing on every single word where you're so, convinced that this is the last chance you have. Oh, that's great. That's great. Jonathan? So I should just come out and say my nemesis was chapter two. All of my friends on Facebook for months were like, so how's chapter two coming? <laughs> um, and the story behind this uh, uh, is, um, you know, as a uh, having done short stories for so long, I had a really good rhythm that worked for me. I could just write for the first draft what was happening. I didn't have to worry about character motivation and history and background because that would come after I kind of knew the core of the story, the concept, uh, uh, the chain of events. And then through my editing process, I would rewrite integrating in after I'd had time to kind of assess like, like that background and, and that motivation. And stories would organically grow out of like three to four drafts. And I, for some reason, <laughs> thought that that was the exact same way one should write a novel. <laughs> and so again, like that, that first draft, that, that really hunky first draft was really this kind of skeletal draft. And I was so kind of big on just making sure that I knew what was happening. So, I mean, I had entire chapters that had some good prose, but then like brackets saying, okay, this will happen here. Or like that conversation that's supposed to go on for a page and a half is, you know, again, like kind of su summarized instead of written out. Um, but chapter two, I, I guess I should say the beginning of the novel opens up with the reunion of two characters who had a horrible falling out from over a decade ago. So needless to say, this relationship is a, is a core uh, uh, plot point throughout the entire novel. And chapter two, I had dedicated to kind of be that flashback chapter to kind of flesh it out. And I was like, I will get to that when I get to that. I got to see what they do. Well, very good. Yeah, that, and that was the problem. Because like going back, there was this huge hole that I had to suddenly mm -hmm. fill in. And what it was six months and and whatever went into that spot i realized had influence over every decision in every other part of the book so i, I think that was the major that's my long way of saying i think the major learning curve for me was just that for a longer project i should have spent half as much time or at least just as much time not just on what happens but carving out that background and actually kind of kind of understanding uh, of those different character motivations and, and, and describing that history. Well, all right. It's kind of a little long-winded. <laughs> no, <coughs> perfectly fine. Uh, Allison. I didn't really find anything that went disastrously wrong, but I probably, well, I mean, I've, I've now drafted the second novel, so I can say that I am not gonna Ooh. probably repeat the process of trying to do a novella first, and then expanding it, but deliberately actually setting out to write novels in the future. And I think the thing that I discovered is that I can indeed actually write something that is novel length. Um, as I said earlier, you know, I, I kind of had in my mind, I can't do this. Novels are scary. I don't know how to hold this entire thing in my head. I'm just going to write short stories um, and just, you know, finishing something and 
seeing that I could actually do it gave me the confidence to do it again and to actually set out to deliberately write a novel from the beginning as opposed to it's a flash fiction story that's just growing and growing. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's like that, it's that, it's the, that Harry Potter thing. He's able to, you know, summon his Patronus because he knows he did it before when he saw his future version do it. <laughs> so no, I did it once, I know I can do it again. Very good. Laura? Yeah, I mean, I, I think the biggest hurdle that I had for myself was thinking that um, it, what I did had to be complete and it had to be perfect the first time um, that I did it and I finished it. Um, and I had a very all or nothing at all mentality that it had to be like great and when it was done it was done and then when I sent it out you know I, I got really good feedback but I had to I had to have something that was going to wow the beta readers before I even you know gave it to them um, and that was like a very undue burden on myself being very tight and constrained and I did find that when I relaxed a little bit um, wonderful things happen in intuition and and so like the main character in my novel is an artist and I had this idea of what her artwork was originally going to be. Um, it was very on the nose. It was very like, and here is a symbol for you. Here's an illusion. And I just had a day where I was just like, I'm going to put this outline that I have carefully crafted and that I think people will like aside and just do. And I had her standing in front of her easel and she did something and I was like, that is infinitely better than what I had planned. So I'm going to roll with that. And that was the moment when I sort of realized like, it's okay to go on intuition and be a little bit unpredictable and be a little bit, um, or not even a little bit, but be intuitive. And so I think that is the thing that I'm going to kind of carry forward with me, that not pressuring to have everything perfect and planned and, and meticulous going forward, but just to say, like, there is some room for discovery in the process because the artwork is sort of drives the novel forward, and I don't think it would have been as creatively successful if I had not had that moment, and so that, that would be it for me. Ooh. It's funny when you said about this focus on whether something is perfect. Uh, when I was writing my novel ages ago, uh, I had a chance to speak uh, to, one of, to one of my literary icons. Uh, her, her book, it's my favorite book of all time. And I really didn't know her well. Um, she... She was a radio host and I called her in between sessions. And so I asked for some advice and her advice was, um, make sure your novel is a perfect novel. And that was horrendous to hear and to try to follow. And, and needless to say, it, it, it caused great duress, delays. And even to this day, while I know that there are very few perfect novels. Um, mm -hmm. uh, it, it haunts me. I mean, part of the problem was I consider her book a perfect novel. So I was like, well, surely this makes sense. But mm -hmm. Anyway. So what book was it? Yeah. Uh, should I say? I think yeah. I know. Oh, okay, Amy. What do you think it is? Is it Swords Point? It is. It's ding, 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 ding. You win a guitar. Uh, <laughs> wow, shipping is, I, I, I ship faster than Amazon these days. Yes, it was Ellen Kushner. She, she laughs. I think she, I've told this story a few times and, you know, she sort of chuckles in, in a maleficent kind of way, all, mm -hmm. but, but she's, she's a good person. She really is. But yes, yes. So never try to write a perfect novel. No, there's no such thing. So, um, all right, so Tyler's last question for the night um, is, so for those of you who have sold your novel, what's some advice that you would like to give? For those of you who have not sold your novel, 
you know, tell us where you are in, in your career. And there is no shame whatsoever. So this is, you know, I, I, all of us want you to succeed. So, uh, Jonathan, you might as well go first because you're smiling and you're on my screen first. So. <laughs> Great. <laughs> well, now Amy's on my screen. No, just kidding. All right, John. Um, well, so I, I'm actually in the uh, querying uh, uh, kind oh, of... Oh, you're very much in the queer... Oh, sorry, querying. Uh, a little bit of okay. column A, a little bit of column B, you know. <laughs> I didn't think um, you liked column, both column A and B, but we're learning things. That's good to know. Oh, my. But yeah, I, I'm right now on a... Um, I'm kind of trying to do one query letter a week to an agent, and that will give me um, six other days to obsess over and rewrite everything I've already submitted. And how are you finding these agents? Uh, I'm actually on Query Tracker, and then I, I find someone there, and then I go and do like a couple hours of research on them. And and, and how are you doing your, your letter? Did you just, you know, did you consult things? I mean, what is... I, I, again, because I, I hired the editor, I actually got a consultation on what the query letter should look like. We went back and forth on it. So, but then of course, I mean, I I, I think you adjust. Uh, I mean, I, I, I find myself re-editing that and reformatting it depending on on who I am uh, submitting to that week. And so theoretically, your your next novel could be just, uh, you know, taking Allison's technique. It could be expanding a query letter into a novel. In, in, in fact, I think that that Amy's partner would love that idea. So that would be epic, and like I, I'd be in some metafiction, you know, catalog. That'd be yeah, that's awesome. true. That's true. All right, Laura. So my advice. So I'm I'm very transparent about the fact that it took me about two and a half, almost three years to sell this novel because I think the stories that we always get told are the sort of instant success stories and they're not helpful. They just mind fuck well, people. According to TV, you know. Ac according to TV, didn't, I'm a millionaire. Did someone on Dawson's Creek once sell the book in like, you know, 36 hours? In, in, yeah, they got, they got a, well, I guess Dawson's Creek, it would be like a, pho a very dramatic phone call. Um, <laughs> because uh, we, were, we were marketing this book and selling it and it was like right around like the election and then that happened and everybody wanted dystopian or they wanted like inner trump world stuff so we cycled through a lot of like she's a good writer but not quite and then you know in 2018 like late 2018 we submitted to Dezank and um they accepted it in early 2019 and they're the best they're the they're just a wonderful press and I'm so happy with them um so just in terms of like tangible advice and things that I have learned from that when you are talking to an agent who's interested in your work you should ask them what is the plan if we don't sell to a big five are you willing to send to indie presses and how long do you want to pursue that that's a really big thing that you should find out and if the agent is not willing to do it um then you know that but um it's something that i would strongly consider you know when when someone is looking at an agent i think that's very important um, when you do sell the book, just build a really good relationship with your editor. And then even when you are revising it, be thinking about opportunities to promote the book, be leveraging any contacts that you have in media, be looking for book reviewers and critics on Twitter and start engaging with them early. So that way, when your book does come out, you don't look like a sort of Johnny come lately. And so... I know, <laughs> um, you, you can, um, you know, so, and then let, you know, leverage any contacts you have at magazine publications, these things like that. Like I, you know, when I announced my book, I was, and I knew it wasn't going to come out till 2020. I contacted all the editors I had worked with and was like, Hey, this is going to be coming out. Like, what can we do? Um, so I would just be very aggressive on the business front as well you know that's something i don't think we also don't talk about enough Ooh. all right speaking of aggressive allison no just kidding 
the opposite of aggressive. Canadians but you're don't wonderful. do aggressive. You're wonderful. <laughs> we apologize for everything. <laughs> no, but actually, you're an aggressive short story writer. You've written a <laughs> lot of stories. You have, all right, maybe not aggressive, but you are ambitious. <laughs> I'll take that. I'll take yeah. that. Um, I mean, one thing that I found was, weirdly, I got less worked up about having a novel out on submission that I do on, did or that I do for having short stories. And I feel like that one degree of separation, the fact that an agent was out there submitting it, it's like, oh, it's all out of my hands. There's absolutely nothing I can do about it. Um, but I also found it really, really valuable actually to have something else to be working on. So focusing on, you know, doing short stories or drafting the second novel. So it wasn't thinking about the fact that the novel was out there on submission. Um, and I feel like that's advice you hear from a lot of people is like, you know, don't wait, start working on the next thing. Keep, keep pushing, keep working, and it will make the anxiety a lot less, which did actually work for me. I sort of, you know, was able to let it go and be like, well, it's out of my hands now. If it sells, great. If it doesn't, oh, well, on to the next thing. Um, so, you know, that's what got me through. <laughs> All right. Amy. All right, so uh, I kind of uh, said earlier that uh, Blackbird is in the trunk. Um, it made the rounds to like 90 agents um, over the course of, I think, a ye over a year. <laughs> um, and I'm not convinced that I won't someday be able to fix it, <laughs> but um, my second novel is actually going out to agents now. And so I'm on Query Tracker. Um, uh, and that's, you know, I'm working on other things, but it's still, I still get worked up about it and I'm like, oh, are they going to like it or are they going to, um, for me that that just keeps coming back. <laughs> that I can't stop thinking about it. If it Don't sells, your second novel, everyone will think is your first novel. And so you can, I come, know. Back, you can come back on this panel again. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> So, um, yeah, I just, and, and I agree with, with kind of the philosophy when that, when I started sending out Blackbird, I was already working on the next novel, um, because I would have gone crazy. I know some people who didn't start work right away and th they were checking their emails every 10 seconds and <laughs> it's Jonathan, like, Jonathan, are you paying attention? <laughs> it's I'm like right. you know we don't <laughs> um you know we all know publishing doesn't happen that quickly <laughs> there's I, I always hear rumors about oh well don't send a query to an agent between november and february <laughs> and then oh not in the summer either and then <laughs> like like when do they work let's Our try birthday. to figure it out and just do it Arbor Day. Arbor Day. Because it's, they, they, <laughs> hate, they, they hate our Arbor Day because it's a celebration of trees and books are made from trees. And so, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, I'm just curious if anyone has uh, a few words of, you know, further inspiration in case Tyler wants to commit all his caterwauling in, in iambic pentameter to, to the page or for any member of the audience if you don't that's fine oh uh, well jonathan right on and jeffrey epstein didn't kill himself <laughs> tyler wasn't that a marvelous panel i'm sure you were captivated on the sofa but maybe you were making plans for our next panel here at tyler Cod. so if you have an idea for Tyler, or want to be a guest on a Tyler Con, we'd be interested in anyone who's involved with books, whether writer, artist, publisher, editor, librarian, blogger, etc. Um, just send Tyler an email at lethepress at aol.com. That's L E T H E press at aol.com. So from Greenfield, Massachusetts, saying good night. Take care.